Today's webinar is entitled Engineering Leadership, an Overview of Programs at RIT. Our presenter today is Mark Smith, Director of Multidisciplinary Programs in RIT's Kate Gleason College of Engineering. In his role at RIT, Mark is responsible responsible for graduate programs in product development and manufacturing leadership, as well as certificates and other customized course offerings for corporate clients. He is also serving as director of the John D. Romey Center for Quality and Applied Statistics. Mark, let's get started. Thank you, Lou. I appreciate it, and thanks to everybody who's joining us on this webinar today. As Lou mentioned, we're talking about some unique leadership programs at RIT, which are housed within the Kate Gleason College of Engineering, but they're in partnership with the Saunders College of, of Business. So that portfolio of programs consists of what you see on the screen. There's the product development leadership program called the MS in product development. There's a manufacturing leadership a program that's focused on operations, supply chain manufacturing, with a broad applicability uh, focused on operational excellence. And then from those two programs, we've crafted several short three-course certificate programs in systems engineering, supply chain management, and project management. But others certainly can be crafted, especially with corporate sponsorship, which is how some of these programs were created in the first place. But the common themes to all of these programs are that they, are, they emphasize leadership and decision making. They have both engineering and business content with a strong systems level orientation. Therefore, people like you who are experienced practitioners and they're available fully online uh, targeting part-time students. We do have some students that participate on a full-time basis, but the goal of this program really is to part-time participants. Now, if you are looking for something else that's not covered here, certainly contact me or Lou Fantosi, and we'll be happy to direct you to somebody with, at, at RIT who might be able to help you in another area. So first, let's spend a few minutes talking about the MS in product development. Historically speaking, this program really was an outgrowth of, of an engineering research center at MIT called the Center for Innovation and Product Development which consisted of a group of companies and universities that were focused on U.S. competitiveness by strengthening leadership in the innovation and product and services. So this program really was crafted from the ground up using the program theme and highest priority as, as project, project or product innovation. As I said earlier, it targets engineers, scientists, and technical managers, has strong systems orientation, and what that really means is that it focuses on managing complexity at the strategic level, about decision making again. It's not, it's not really a practitioner level systems engineering program. We have other courses and other programs that might address that. This is really, again, at the management leadership level. The core of that, and that's the core of the program, but also we provide flexibility through an elective and a capstone project, which allow you and your organization, your sponsoring organization, to tailor the program to individual and business needs. We started this in 1999. We average about 13 new students a year. We have over 200 graduates and about 35 companies are represented. It's, it has 30 credits, which is the minimum number of credits that New York State allows us to have to, to issue a master's degree. Um, so that means that we're trying to keep this as low cost and as time considerate as we possibly can. So it really takes, for somebody that's able to take two courses a term, you're able to finish in just over one calendar year. From an admission perspective, it requires two years of experience at least, although our average is closer to 12 and 13, uh, and a 3.0 undergraduate uh, GPA. But don't uh, dismay if you haven't quite achieved a 3.0 GPA. There are certainly other factors that we consider, and we're happy to take a look at reference letters as well as other things that you may have that would make a strong case for why we should accept you into the program. Um, but we want to make sure that students are at least experienced at the two-year level. Any questions about this, as mentioned earlier, please don't hesitate to submit a chat uh, on the chat box on the right. Very briefly, uh, to go over the curriculum, as I said, at the highest level, we're focusing on leadership and decision-making. Those are the guiding principles. The first three bullet points really constitute the core of the pro program. And the courses there, there are four courses, the Excellence in Product Development, Project Management, and then two Systems Engineering courses. The focus, again, is on leadership, systems, and sort of process excellence, process improvement. 
Um, we deal with leadership both at the personal and at the organizational level, and the emphasis, again, is on product and services innovation. It's not really uh, geared towards general, general purpose leadership. And as on the engineering of systems side, again, it's focusing on managing and reducing complexity, which is a real challenge for most organizations. Then after that core, we have a series of courses that I'd call enabling. They provide supporting skills required for anybody that's in a leadership role. And the first of those is decision and risk benefit analysis. This complements both the engineering of systems courses as well as our project management course. But it focuses on a wide range of decision-making tools and methods, both probabilistic and non-probabilistic. You can see some of those things that are listed there, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you have about it on more detail. So that's the first course. The next slide shows some of the other courses in the program. Everybody has to understand the broader context of operations and supply chain management, whether you're an engineer, a project manager, or even a more senior leader. So we have a course that focuses on that. And then everything's kept track of via, via dollars and cents, so it's really important that we have a course in accounting. You're certainly not going to be an expert in accounting or in any of these areas. We're trying to provide breadth of exposure so that as a decision maker, you know if people on your team are providing of competent business plans, competent uh, input into the processes to allow you to make decisions based on that information. Um, we also have a course in marketing concepts and commercialization, which deal with the all-important both inbound and outbound marketing, looking at the five Ps, and then taking a look at uh, how you generate customer value with, with your products or services at the portfolio as well as at the individual product level. So those are really the required courses in the program. And then, as I said earlier, we have both a capstone project, which consists of a full year. And the two criteria we have for that is that it has to address a real business problem. That doesn't mean to say that it's focused on your, at your particular organization, but it does have to focus on a business problem that is, is common and uh, creates significant challenges for organizations that have that problem. The other element, the other characteristic is that it has to have a scholarly component. And all that means is you've got, it, it's something that you could publish if you, just, if you wanted to do that, but we don't require that, that you do so. For example, if you've ever read a Harvard business case, that would be considered scholarly in, in the sense that you're doing writing up a case study on the use of certain principles or practices in a new and unique situation, whether it's your company or something else. So you don't have to come up with something that's brand spanking new, but you have to at least come up with something that represents a new or novel application of established business practices. And then last but not least, we have an elective in the program, and that allows you to do some level of tailoring and customization, certainly not as much as you could with many more electives, but uh, we really feel that we need to go through the required material as I've defined earlier. Here are a couple of examples of the kinds of electives that our students have found attractive. They can be used either to expand breadth or to dive down a little bit deeper for more depth. So managing and research and innovation, for example, deals with things like disruptive innovation, which I suspect that you've all heard about before, and uh, as well as how do you plan the resources to manage projects at that sort of in innovation and introductory level. I see there's a question here from Matt. If one had an undergraduate engineering degree and an MBA, can some of the classes uh, be waived? Unfortunately, uh, in New York State, we're required to have at least 30 new credits. So the, and and our, since our program is already at the minimum level, which is 30, we can't waive any courses. However, we certainly don't want you to repeat material. So what we can do if you have the uh, consistent, or I should say the same level of background, let's say you've had a graduate level course in accounting that maps pretty closely to our accounting for decision makers course, and we're happy to give you an alternative course to take so you're not repeating that material. So in effect, somebody who has that kind of a background would have a couple more electives to take in the program. Uh, you know, I wish New York State gave us more flexibility, but unfortunately they don't. We have to have 30 new credits. Does that answer? Great. Thank you. Any other questions? I have to keep looking up to the screen to see the questions, so I'm not, uh, I've got to handle that a little bit better. But here on the screen you can see there's a couple of other electives listed. Lots of students are really interested in getting some level of uh, Lean Six Sigma certification. Now, this course, while it doesn't provide green belt certification, does provide yellow belt certification. And with a project, which actually could be your capstone, you, you may be able to achieve green belt certification just as a byproduct of participating in the MPD program. This also applies, by the way, to the Manufacturing Leadership Program that I'll talk about in a few minutes. 
Okay, the next slide. If I can hit the right button here. Okay. Here are just a few sample capstone projects. We have a full list on our website. If you want more detail, by all means, send an email to me or to Lou. We'll even be happy to provide you with a copy of the capstone report or presentation that the student or students gave as, as a result of completing their capstone. But as a general rule, the focus um, on, uh, of capstone projects tends, tends to be on broad, on broad processes associated with value creation. So for example, you may be frustrated that your company doesn't do a particularly good job of generating great project ideas or product ideas. You may want to focus on the early phase of, of the product development, uh, you know, innovation ideas and those sorts of things that you might want to feed into the pipeline. Or your company may do a great job of generating ideas but does a poor job of killing projects or putting them through a pipeline where those projects will come out the back end that have a really reasonable chance of being successful. So those are the kinds of things. So you can see the types of projects students are interested in. But I certainly urge you to go and look at a broader list that we have on the website. Um, I've got a couple slides here that are called targeted competencies. I'm not going to spend much time on them. I, I hope that these are competencies that you would expect to see in a leadership program in product development. Um, you know, you can read them yourselves. I'll just mention a couple of, uh, highlight a couple of them. Certainly make, as I, I said, since our, the core of our program is systems engineering or the engineering of systems, we really want people to think in a broad sort of systems oriented way. So we, we focus on that, looking at the end-to-end -end product development process. How do you establish um, sort of a, a technology and a business roadmap? How do you decide what you're going to do? And then how do you get that into the, both into the early phases to make decisions about where you're headed? And then how do you get that through the entire product development process, way to the back end, which could be retirement or sustainability or something like that? So we want you to be, be fully um, fully savvy to the entire end-to-end -end value chain and the whole product development process and how it operates. Um, decision making, I already mentioned the importance of the risk-benefit analysis course. We certainly go into that in much more detail than you would in, in any other program that, that I'm aware of anyway, certainly in an MBA and other sorts of things. So again, it's focused on leaders and their, the importance of making decisions with inadequate data. So you have to, you know, if you had, if you had Perfect data, anybody could make the decision, but uh, you're always operating in a data, in a data poor environment. And then, of course, having a market oriented product development focus. What does the market need? What are lead users? How do you engage customers? And, and how, how do customers tell you what they need? And when they don't, how do you figure out what's important to develop? So, all of those are important characteristics of what we emphasize. And these competencies really are what our faculty use to try to guide the course material that they, that they deliver. So that um, you know, this stuff all ties together in the end to generate some kind of positive, um, you know, d development of skills that are, that are related in, to these areas. So the second set, you, know, you can imagine, project management is very important, and, and certainly understanding when barriers uh, arise and trying to make sure that you, you know, you 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 stop doing things that aren't going to lead to success very early when those actions are less costly. Once you're into manufacturing, once you're releasing a product, doing something to change or to, to stop doing something is extremely expensive. So we really want you to make um, sort of very early um, decisions to the, best, to, to the best of your ability. This is a laundry list of, of some of the sponsors that we've had in the program. Some of your companies may be there and others may not. What this means is that these are just companies um, that have sent students to the product development program since it started in 1999. Some companies clearly have sent more, Xerox, Kodak, for example. Uh, Harris Company, we actually run a cohort-based program over at Harris and a couple of other companies. So these are firms that have sent students. So that's about it for the product development program, at least at this high level. Um, if you have any other questions, please, again, post them, and I'll try to address them. Are there any more there? Nope, that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next uh, degree program I plan on spending a few minutes on is the MS in, Man in Manufacturing Leadership. As I said earlier, it really has a broad focus around operational excellence. So you can probably imagine just about anything um, that has uh, a business sort of orientation can benefit from an emphasis on operations and operational excellence. Uh, because of the importance of lean and reducing waste, lean is certainly a strong element in our programs. 
Um, just as with the MPD program, it's for experienced practitioners moving to mid and senior level management positions. But again, the emphasis is a little different. It's more on manufacturing, supply chain, process engineering, that sort of thing. And as in the case of MPD, you know, we have both business and engineering courses, so roughly 50% uh, on each side. We also have a capstone project, which is tied to a direct, directly to a specific company, a specific organization. That's a little different than the MPD program. And uh, these projects generate significant return on investment. Our average historically has been about $300,000. So if you're looking at trying to make a business case for why uh, your company ought to invest in sending you to a program like this, it's pretty straightforward in my view. If, if you say it's going to cost me about 50000 to do, go to the program, but within the first year I'll generate about 300000 in return on that investment, now that's a fairly easy business decision. So if you go and look at your risk-benefit analysis and for, for uh, the funding of a graduate program that generates uh, you know, six to one return on investment, I'd say that's a pretty reasonable, that's a pretty reasonable value proposition for, for really one year payback. So, um, it's, it's really a nice at aspect of the program, and these capstone projects really take about an entire year to complete. So you'll start in the, usually in the fall and finish in the spring with a report and a presentation to your peers as well as to your managers. And uh, it gives you not only a significant return on investment, but it also gives you some additional visibility within your firm or with whomever you decide to invite to the project. Uh, this program started a bit earlier in 1996, and we average about 15 students per year. Uh, we have over 240, almost 250 graduates, and over 50 companies have sent students historically. Just like uh, the MPD program, this is at the minimum number of credits that New York State allows us to issue for a master's degree, 10 courses or 30 credits. It's fully available online. If you happen to be in the, in the greater Rochester area or nearby, there certainly are evening courses which you can attend on campus for about half of the courses in the program. But even those students that are local tend to, tend to prefer the flexibility afforded them by an asynchronous online delivery model, which means that you're able to go through the material at sheer speed, at least on a weekly basis, and then you interact with, with other students and with the instructor on a weekly basis through discussion boards, online chats, as well as a, a real-time office hour one week, which is optional. Uh, just as in the MPD program, our admission requirements are the same. Um, and I didn't mention earlier, but um, you know, we don't think that a graduate entrance exam provides much indication of future success. At least we haven't seen it, so we don't see there's any reason to ask you to, to complete one of those exams. You're certainly welcome to take one, particularly if on the borderline. If you have a 2.7 or 2.8 GPA and you're a little worried about getting in, if you take the entrance exam and you do very well on it, that will be certainly um, something in your favor. Slide. Here is an overview of the curriculum. Just as an MPD, we have a leadership course. It's called Organizational Behavior and Leadership. It's a little more general purpose than the Excellence and New Product Development in the Product Development Program, uh, but it, it focuses on both personal and organizational leadership, and you can see some of the topics listed. It should be no surprise that we have a course in Supply Chain Management, another in Manufacturing Systems, which focuses on manufacturing at a single firm, at a single uh, entity, so that really has a very strong lean manufacturing orientation. Um, we have a course on facilities planning, which looks not just at planning, say, a ma manufacturing facility, but can be used uh, for almost any kind of facility involved in, in a business, from warehouse design to distribution facilities to the warehouses, I mean, the whole nine yards. And you actually do design a facility as part of the course. Other courses, we have some some overlap with the MPD program because these concepts and these principles are very important regardless of whether you're leading a supply chain function or supply chain organization or whether you're leading a product development organization. Engineering of Systems 1, as I said earlier, is about the entire end-to-end -end product development process. Uh, Lean Six Sigma Fundamentals, I mentioned that as a, an elective for the MPD program. It's a required course here for MM&L. I think for obvious reasons, you're focused on operational and process excellence. We also require a project management course. There are several, by the way. We have one that's called Systems and Project Management, but most of our students take uh, the Introduction to Project Ma Management, which is available fully online every, every semester, both fall, spring, and summer. Then we have the same accounting course, because again, you've got to understand accounting principles in order to be in a leadership and a management role. 
I already talked a bit about the capstone project with its 300,000 average return on investment after the first year. Uh, most of the projects that students have done have a strong lean uh, kind of orientation to them. On the elective level, there are many choices as there were with the MPD program. Mm -hmm. And what I'll say is that before, before registration opens each term, you know, I pro provide a list to our students of courses that I think they may be interested in. There are certainly more and you're welcome to browse the catalog, but we're really trying to provide some suggestions for students that may not be sure of what they want to take as an elective. The next slide shows some sample capstone projects. Again, these are focused, even though I haven't listed the companies uh, that the projects were done at, each one of these projects was executed at a particular firm. Uh, and that's, again, I mentioned um, very early on that, you know, you're focused on doing something that reduces cost, improves productivity, improves flow, whatever it is, at a particular firm within a particular department. And these are just some, some examples. And again, there's a laundry list available on the website. These are the targeted competencies for the MMNL program. Again, top level view, leadership and decision making. But uh, going down one step, there are certainly focus, and these are the focus areas of having strong business acumen. That's important for anybody in a leadership role. Focus on, uh, focusing on global multi-site production and operations. Understanding total quality and quality principles. That certainly is where our Lean Six Sigma course focuses. And the understanding of what the global supply chain looks like, uh, whether you're an engineer or somebody in purchasing or manufacturing or um, logistics, that's very, very important. And then, of course, having strong leadership and management skills with a particular focus on high-tech manufacturing. So those are, the, those are the competencies that drive our faculty when they're looking at courses and the course content, the things they're asking you to read, the problems they're asking you to work on. Uh, those are the themes that tend to drive those decisions. Here are some of the sponsors. I mentioned again there are over 50, so we didn't quite put them all on here. One of your company or your company may be on this list. And this this uh, presentation will go out to you at the end, so you don't have to scribble down all these companies or uh, some of the material that we're going over. We'll cover that later, or you'll have a copy of it. Um, a few minutes just to talk about um, these derivative certificate programs. Remember I mentioned that some companies, some individuals are not quite ready to dive into a full you know, master's degree, but we want to provide some kind of takeaway for, for employees, for, for professionals who still want to get a credential, and that credential would be you know, a nice certificate that will be, you can frame and put on your wall that will demonstrate to somebody that you've developed a certain level of competence in a particular area. Uh, but if you decide you want to go on, by all means, all of these courses are fully um, certified graduate level courses, and we take those courses from the Product Development and Manufacturing Leadership Program. So uh, you'll see at the very bottom, the admission criteria are exactly the same because we don't want somebody to take a few courses with us and then find out they, they can't get accepted into the full master's program. So again, a couple of years, 3.0 GPA exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis. Courses are all available online. If you have a group of folks at a company, uh, organization, we can provide them on-site or we can do a combination of on-site and on, uh, web conferencing or even asynchronous online. You know, when we're doing something like this on a customized basis, we're happy to adapt to, to your needs. Um, so here are the three that we have created, but as I mentioned earlier, if your organization is looking at something a little bit different, uh, we're happy to craft something for you. The systems engineering, as you can imagine, can, uh, is comprised of the two systems courses plus a third course. We give you some flexibility in, in what you choose as the elective. Supply chain uh, management certificate has um, one of our supply chain management courses, uh, has manufacturing systems, although you may focus, you may instead want to do facilities planning or accounting. We'll allow those as, as um, replacements. And then you have a third course to take, similarly for project management. Uh, here's a way of looking at how these the two degree programs can be decomposed <laughs> into certificates. So if you're not sure, you know, start by taking the systems engineering certificate. Once you're done with that, you can take the project management certificate, the supply chain certificate, and as long as you choose the courses within those certificates properly, 
There will be no extra courses that you've had to take towards the MPD degree. And then when you're finished with those nine courses, there's three more, uh, there's three more courses to take and you'll have uh, three more credits, one course, to complete the MS in product development. And that's your capstone project, which spans about one year. So that's one way, that's another way of sort of going after uh, the full degree program. Similarly for the MMNL degree, um, because systems engineering is not really one of the core competencies within that program, we require only that first course, which deals with the end-to-end -end product development process and product development, uh, you know, the execution of product development projects and processes, uh, as well as the project management certificate, the supply chain management certificate, but then you have three more courses that are required in order to get the full MS in manufacturing leadership degree. And those are the courses that you would take depending on which degree you were interested in if you wanted to decompose the, the program into certificates. Again, you'll have a copy of this to refer to. I'll just say a couple of words about the online format. You know, some of you may or may not have taken online courses before. <laughs> it's a practical necessity for us because so many of our students now, over 50%, are located well, well outside of the Western New York area. And even if you're in this area, as I tried to uh, allude to earlier, it's very convenient, particularly for working busy professionals like you, <coughs> excuse me, to be able to, you know, access the material anytime and from any location. So that's a, that's a really important reason for why the online asynchronous format is important. Um, but we also do have opportunities for you to directly engage with faculty and other students, as I said, uh, with discussion boards, through projects, through, um, you know, through the weekly uh, office hour that's provided by our faculty. Um, but certainly the experience is as good as or better than on campus. One thing we've really found with online courses is that the, the quality of the discussions, the emails, the threads that are ongoing really are very, very high and frankly are higher than they usually are with discussions in the classroom environment. And I, I'm speculating on the underlying cause for that, but I think it's because if you're going to post something, you're going to spend some time thinking about what you're putting down, what you're asking about, and you will have looked at all of the other posts before doing that. Whereas if you're in a classroom, you tend to be much more spontaneous. You raise your hand, you ask a question, and it may not have been particularly well thought out before you did that. So we found that these online discussion threads have been very, very high quality and generate a lot of opportunity for other students to actually answer questions, which is not usually the case in a um, kind of in a traditional classroom environment. As I said, these are all asynchronous, which means you're not, you don't have to be there at a particular time, at least not for the classroom material. You'll be downloading and watching a variety of videos that will be interspersed with uh, activities that you need to, to do, whether it's reading or whether it's projects or homework assignments. So we try to keep you engaged even though you're not you know, actively listening to something with other people in real time. Um, as you can imagine, that means there's going to be reduced lecture content. Our emphasis is on sort of this both asynchronous and synchronous interaction, as well as using lots of other resources that are available through the web, whether there are case studies, whether there are videos, there's all kinds of stuff that, um, that the faculty bring into their, into their uh, asynchronous weekly material. Um, we also have something at RIT called the Innovative Learning Institute, and that's an organization that really keeps track of what the state of the art is around online learning. And so they make sure that our faculty are well informed of the tools, that, the techniques, and sort of the rules of thumb that they should follow in order to ensure that the student is getting a really comprehensive and high quality experience in an, in an online course. Uh, last but certainly not least are the logistics. RIT's full-time tuition, or I should say full part-time tuition rate is currently for this year $1,740 a credit hour. That translates to one course is about $5,200. Three courses, say for a three-course certificate, would cost about fifteen six. Now that's a, that's a non-discounted rate and we have, do have uh, discounts available for corporations. Uh, and that means the full MPD or MMNL program is priced at about 52 k But again, I, I encourage you to think about return on investment. So when you look at that or you're trying to make a case for why your organization should sponsor you, I think there are ways of doing that. We're happy to help if we can. Uh, in terms of the time and the workload that's required for you, consider that sort of the asynchronous material will take you about two hours uh, per week per three-credit course. 
You'll have an optional uh, office hour of one hour. Not all faculty do that, but mo many of them do. Uh, there'll be other things that you can participate in like that <laughs> if they don't have an office hour. And you can spec expect between three and six hours per week of homework. So the total commitment is six to nine hours. So you need to be able to figure out where you're going to find that time. If you're working you know, 70, 80 hours a week, it's going to be really difficult for you to, to, to bite off a course, uh, and certainly not two courses. So for the average full-time employee, one to two courses per semester is about right. Um, full, any more than that, you're certainly not a full-time employee, um, and that's something to consider. Uh, at the bottom is the RIT's calendar. For those of you, you're all alumni, so you probably remember that RIT was on a quarter system for most of its history. A couple of years ago, we switched to a semester-based format, so now we have the fall, the spring, and the summer. And after having a 16-week semester format here for the past two years, we're actually switching to a 14-week semester format starting next fall. So I don't think that's something you need to worry about right now. Um, the courses are the same. The credits are the same. It's just that we've adopted a format that allows our summer to be the same length as the fall and the spring terms, which are all 14 weeks. Those are the times, the rough times at which they start and end, in case you're trying to plan, you know, your life around uh, when courses start and end. So that's all I planned on covering. These are our contacts. I'm the director, Lou Fantosi is the business development manager, and uh, Chris Fisher is our program coordinator. Yeah, Lou, Lou has a couple of other points to raise. Yeah, Mark, we've got a couple of questions ah, here. Great. Um, here's sure. one. What type of jobs have MPD program and MML program alumni moved to in meeting their career goals? Sure. Uh, I think in both cases, uh, in terms of the jobs that students were in before they entered the program, the MPD program tends to have students that I would call senior level engineers. About 90% of the students in the program are, are in that kind of category. Now we have more junior level engineers, certainly people that have less experience. And so for those folks, they're, they're going to be moving from a hardcore sort of practitioner level role as a, you know, a product engineer, uh, an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, and again, I'm using just the engineering domain. And we have students that are coming from marketing and business backgrounds. We have some that are industrial design students. But they tend to be going from a practitioner level into, a, at, probably at first, if they're at that level, into a project management or a program management role. And then we think that we've provided them with enough background. They don't need to get another degree, but then experience will dictate when they're moving from a project or a program management role into a sort of a, a divisional directorship, whether that's, it depends on your company and what terminology is used. It could be an engineering manager. It could be a product development manager. On the MM&L side, it could be a supply chain manager. It could be a plant manager. But in general, for both programs, students are starting at the practitioner level and moving into more of a program or a project or a supervisory role, and then on from there. So, you know, again, we look at this program as being something that provides you with that breadth. Uh, you know, you've heard this expression, T-level uh, individuals, I'm sure, that have a strong depth of focus in a particular area, whatever that happens to be for you. But the MM&L and MPD programs tend to provide that breadth on the business side that allows you to be in a role to be, be making decisions and directing the future of your organization or your company. Does that help? Does yep. that make sense? Yep, that's good. Uh, second question, uh, if you could say a few more words about entry requirements, particularly with regard to uh, what's, what kind of range of different undergraduate degrees, breadth <laughs> in terms of technical and business areas are applicable to the MPD as well as the MML program? Sure. I mean, it's a really important because this is a leadership program. I don't, I don't um, espouse to the notion that somebody who has just gotten out of an undergraduate program can suddenly get a master's in business administration. And I, I don't want to pick on the MBA, but I mean, master's in business means that you've got a fair amount of experience because business is such an experientially sort of driven career path. Um, so I think it's really important that people have experience. But in terms of the degrees, we have a wide range. As I said just a minute ago, most of the students in the MPD program came from an undergraduate engineering experience. But we have people that are in technology. You know, our School of Applied Science and Technology, we have lots of students that come from there. As I said, we have students that have been in marketing roles. We have industrial design students. But the common thread, again, mm -hmm. is that you've had a strong kind of um, uh, practitioner level orientation 
and then are, are ready to move on. It's not, it's because you're interested and you have the kind of uh, aptitude and sort of focus in, in trying to be in those roles to help guide your organizations. So it's a fairly broad list. Now on the MMNL side, we have more business students that enter the MMNL program than, than we do on the MPD side. And that's partly because the program really was crafted and started partly by the College of Business here uh, to provide an alternative to students that really weren't interested in a full-blown MBA program, which is a lot more credits than 30, so like 46 or 48, it depends on how you count. <laughs> um, so it's really the shortest path to getting a master's degree, as I mentioned earlier, in New York State, but still having an orientation around manufacturing, process excellence, operational excellence, and supply chain management. So it's certainly not for everyone, um, if you, if for example, so if you're, if you're moving from, say, right now you're in a supervisory role and you're moving into more of a business function, then I would argue that probably the MBA is a better program for you. But if you're, you know, if you really want to stay close to, you know, to the operational character aspects of your firm or on the, on the product development side, if you want to stay close to engineering and the technology side, then I think the MPD or the MML program may be a better choice for you. Does that help? Makes sense. Very much so. Thank you so much, Mark. My pleasure. That's all the time we have for Q&A. Additional questions can be emailed to ritalum at rit.edu or tweeted to at rit underscore alumni with the hashtag MeRITWebinars. And we will direct your questions to Mark. Note that all participants will receive an email from 